Okay, good evening. My name is Kate Enon Law, and I'm on the board of directors for Solus Nua. I want to thank you for joining us this evening, and I hope you enjoyed the film, Kevin Roche, The Silent Architect. It's a true masterpiece of an architectural documentary. I had the chance to speak to Mark Noonan, the director of the film last week. Mark is based in Berlin and gives us more insight into the soul and character of Kevin Roche in this pre-recorded conversation. If you've enjoyed SIF at Home, you're gonna love Solus Nua's Capital Irish Film Festival, presented with the American Film Institute at its Silver Theater and Cultural Center in Silver Spring. In person, March 3rd to Sunday, March 6th. You're gonna have a chance to see the best in Irish feature films and shorts. And this year on March 4th of the festival, we are conferring the first Norman Houston Short Film Award, which honors our late friend, colleague, and director of the Northern Ireland Bureau, to the best short film for Northern Ireland. More about that in the schedule of films will be coming in, in this week. But passes are on sale now. So for more information, go to solusnua.org and make sure you're on our mailing list. And as always, be generous and hit the donate button. Your donation helps us pay our artists and producers involved in the programming. Now sit back, relax, and hear more about Kevin Roche, the silent architect. When the uh, discussion is finished, the webinar will finish, and we will see you at the Capital Irish Film Festival soon. Thank you. Hello, and thank you for joining us. My name is Kate Neenan Law, and I'm on the board of Solus Nua. And tonight, we have a pre recorded discussion here with Mark Noonan, the director of a visually stunning film, Kevin Roche, The Quiet Architect. Mark is uh, Berlin based and toward the end of the discussion, we'll certainly be able to hear from him about some of his new and ongoing projects. But tonight, let's, let's dig in a little deeper about Mr. Roche, the architect. Um, I will say that Mark is himself a graduate of the UCD architecture program. So it's particularly um, pertinent, I think, to look at this visual, this incredibly visual film about the work of an architect who may not be known to many people, but in fact, you have probably been in one of his buildings or know one of his buildings very well. Certainly the film points out um, iconic things such as the Ford Foundation um, Center in New York City, the Sackler Museum and all the other 20th century additions to the Metropolitan Museum of Art, particularly that stunning room where the Temple of Dendur is exhibited. For our NYU followers, um, the Kimmel Student Center on the main NYU campus in New York City is also a Kevin Roche project. For our DC viewers, there are two uh, large office complexes here in DC that are um, Kevin Roche projects. One is Station Place, which is next to Union Station, and the other is Capital Crossing, which is only really a couple blocks away from Union Station. So Mark, if we could, let's, let's just kind of dive right in. Um, the quiet architect, he does say in the film that he's not a architect, um, that he really wishes he had been a poet, um, mm -hmm. he says, because poets don't have clients. But I think mm -hmm. he also has this sort of aesthetic that his buildings represent something different from what he came from in terms of his training. And we'll hopefully get into that a little bit more. But let's, you know, let's talk about the title, how you came upon the title and how the project as itself came came about? Yeah, so maybe I'll start with how the project came about because that kind of fed in then to how we decided on a title. So the project um, came about through a chance meeting in Berlin actually um, before I was living there but when I was attending the Berlin Film Festival um, which is one of the major film festivals in the world and I happened to be having a dinner um, organized by Irish, the Irish Film Board, Screen Ireland, and I was seated beside a sales representative um, who distributed architectural documentaries. Mm -hmm. And he was super interested to discover that I was a practicing, not a practicing, a qualified architect who would now become a filmmaker. Mm -hmm. um, and so we exchanged business cards. And then a few years later, I think around the um, occasion of Kevin's 90th birthday, he emailed me and asked me, would I be interested in doing a film about Kevin? And 
I didn't really know that much about Kevin because he, he his legacy is not that well known in Ireland, um, mm-hmm. which is kind of tragic. Mm-hmm. And especially at UCD, you know, he was never mentioned. So I thought that was kind of fascinating. There was this kind of hidden architect um, who had went to America, you know, in his mid twenties um, and become a huge architectural icon uh, worldwide. But he was very, very unknown in Ireland and kind of in Europe um, to that extent. So that's kind of how I kind of signed on to the project um, at a very early stage. Um, and then through kind of the research and meeting Kevin and talking to his wife, Jane, and kind of, I suppose, immersing myself in him and his work, um, we decided the Quiet Architect was kind of apt. Um, number one, because it recalled the John Ford film, The Quiet Man, which is this kind yeah. of Irish American, obviously, story told by an Irish American filmmaker had a great connection between Ireland and America um, but also yeah as you see from Kevin and um, from his interviews and if you spend time with him he, he's not a loud guy he is very softly spoken he's quite introspective he definitely has the soul of a poet um, so you know doesn't appear interested did not appear interested in fame or his reputation or legacy. It's one of those things that really fascinated me was he really doesn't like talking about you know, his legacy, about like what the buildings mean, you know, like after he's gone, it's really just, no, no, he moves on to the next building. He does the Ford Foundation and then moves on to like the Oakton Museum, whatever. He doesn't sit around and go, wow, it's going to be there for, you know, a hundred years after I'm gone or, or whatever it is. So seemed pretty apt the title i think yeah it's it's lovely and it's lovely that we get to meet him so the film that actually came out in 217 uh i believe he was what 94 as you interviewed Mm. him uh he passed away two years after the film came out in 219 uh passed away at the age of 96 and i think one of the uh very poignant moments in the film is when you're interviewing both he and his wife jane and he asks his wife, you know, what time is it? She says 11 o'clock. And he says, oh, I think I'll go back to the office. So mm-hmm. this is obviously a man who at age 94, um, this, this quiet sort of uh, icon building uh, builder and, and designer is just constantly working. And mm-hmm. so how much of that ethos did you feel as you interviewed him, as you dug into the research. I mean, this is a man who lived and breathed his career, his, his mm. avocation, his vocation, all of his life. Yeah. 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 It's kind of fascinating. You know, I think I'm always fascinated by people who are passionate about something. I think we all have that kind we all respond to people who have a real interest, love, um, whatever it is can really rub off on you. So I think Kevin's passion for his work, I mean, I don't know if I've ever seen anything quite um, as, as powerful. Like he was really not interested in, in free time. You know, that, that thing that we all like to do. A lot of people like to play golf. A lot of people like to, you know, go to the gym or exercise or meet friends for dinner. He really didn't um, enjoy any of that. Um, and it's kind of interesting. Well, I think it's, yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting way though to think about living you know, if you don't have to retire, you know, if you love your work so much, uh, which is what we're kind of, I think, yeah, I'm pretty sure I was told um, as a youngster, you know, if you find a vocation that you love, you'll never work a day in your life. Um, And I think Kevin really brought that home because he doesn't see it as work. You know, he goes to the office and for him, it's not like going to a regular office because Mm -hmm. he's going there to to think about design, think about architecture, to solve Mm -hmm. a problem. and I mean, there, there's a there's another side to that as well. You know, he he does admit, you know, that he probably didn't spend as much time, you know, with his family as you know as he could have or as he should have. Um, and that's a choice he made. You know, he chose to kind of surround himself um, with architecture, and that kind of not that it was his priority, but it was it was up there with his family. And um, so he was he was definitely a workaholic. You know, like yeah. 100%. Yeah. <laughs> but I don't. But I just don't think he saw it in those terms. You know, because it just wasn't work. It was. It was pure passion. And, and obviously we see his, his life partnership uh, with Jane, who I believe is still living. Um, and so how, how crucial was she in helping to draw him out and to get some of his, his, his voice and cooperation throughout the film? 
Mm, yeah, I mean, I think without Jane, we wouldn't have a film because when we first approached Kevin um, to make a film about his work, about his, about his life, he really wasn't interested. You know, he, we got like a flat kind of basically no, but then Jane followed up um, and said like, you know, don't, don't drop it just yet. Um, and she managed to talk to him, I think, and mm -hmm. really um, turn him around because I think she saw as well how important he was to architecture, you know, and I think it is like she did see this film as like this could be kind of his life's work, you know, on screen. Um, mm. And it could, especially in Ireland as well, in Europe, it could really kind of get the word out about this superstar architect who's just remained off the curriculum, you know, in universities mm. and, um, and in terms of architectural students as well. I mean, I, we, they, they're just not that aware of him. So I thought, like, I think she was really crucial in convincing him also that we kind of knew what we were doing and we wouldn't do a butcher job. You know, we wouldn't, yeah. um, we'd try and make something beautiful. We'd, fi we'd film his work in kind mm -hmm. of a manner befitting it. Um, so, yeah, bless, bless Jane, yeah, for convincing, <laughs> convincing him, yeah, because he had no interest in doing it, honestly. And, I, and I, I do think the film succeeds in highlighting his work, and I do want to make sure we have time to talk about your collaborators in the film, um, i.e. the cinematographer, Kate McCullough, the, um, um, the guy who did the music, you know, so we just want to make sure that we have time for that. But uh, I think what the film does is remind us as you know, members of the world in 2022 that now when we think about architecture, we automatically think about, is, is it green? You know, will the mm -hmm. building fit the purpose and the people? Um, does the building fit the terrain? Um, does the building create community? I mean, these are all concepts that Kevin Roche came on to very early on and it's what informed all of his designs really you know mm. how to make how to make the the designs spectacular but also intimate um how to you know the the idea of the green roof and the oakland museum with the with the the park and the ford foundation building with the interior greenery etc i mean these are all the ford foundation is 1960s so these are all things that were on his radar and he was actualizing so much earlier than what we now consider those kinds of questions to be part of the discussion of any new building. So. Yeah, he was really revolutionary, I think, uh, in a way that I don't know if he's been given credit to in terms of um, the architectural legacy in general, especially of green architecture. Um, and I think one of the things that he did that nobody else was doing at the time was thinking about that at the office worker. And he does, like, I think he, he does say in the film, you know, he has massive, huge sympathy for the office worker. The, the, the person who has to go and sit at a desk for seven, eight, nine, 10, 12 hours, you know, in a cubicle, no natural light, no greenery. Uh -huh. um, and I think just by putting himself in the shoes of someone like that, he showed himself to be hugely empathetic architect and really designed buildings for that office worker to improve their lives. Um, because I think he, he, I don't know if he, he definitely worked in offices, but I feel like he was in circles where he heard about office workers and I think talking to them when he was designing the buildings, because he did a huge amount of research and interviewing the people who were going to be using his buildings, which I don't think was that common at the time. Exactly. Yeah. And I think he really started designing on a human level, even though the, the buildings are huge. You know, if you see some of these corporate, HQs, they're really gigantic beasts of buildings, mm -hmm. but at a human level, they really work. Um, and it seems like the people who use them and work in them appreciate that consideration in terms of natural light and access to greenery and nature and, um, and then the environmental stuff as well, like for foundation, you know, using the gutters to collect rainwater so that they could water kind of the, the huge amounts of foliage with that as well. Yeah. Was something yeah. that kind of no one was doing at the time. So yeah. Yeah. He, was, um, he was certainly ahead of the curve, I feel. Mm -hmm. And even something like uh, his use of uh, the old slide carousel projector to mm. essentially sell his designs, pacing the potential client through each stage of what it would look like you know, mm -hmm. now the PowerPoint or the slide deck has become so ubiquitous, but the idea that he felt he had to 
allow the potential clients to see what the thinking was, what each layer mm. would look like, and to essentially travel with a, a slide carousel. Yeah, I, I think that was another kind of aspect of Kevin's work where he was ahead of everyone else. And another aspect was that he really understood that a lot of clients can't read architectural drawings. Mm -hmm. um, and so he really started to push architectural models um, in a way that other people weren't doing as much, I think. Um, and if you visit his office, we were fortunate to visit his office and see they have a huge model workshop. You know, half the office is dedicated to making, you know, architectural models, scale models so that the client can really see themselves in the building, can see their workers in the building, understand how the building relates to the human level um, and it gets it off the you know off the screen or off the piece of paper and brings the building alive so i think the combination of his carousels you know his um his powerpoint presentations and the models mm -hmm. and it's why he was so successful he got so many commissions i think by using these before other people could see their value yeah so you know other than the the challenge of getting a quiet architect to talk about himself mm. what were some of the other challenges in putting this film together I think we had the obvious challenge of funding, you know, at the beginning, it's not kind of sexy subject, maybe, you know, uh, <laughs> people were not lining up with checkbooks open. So there was the funding was trickling in over, I think it was probably a period of about three years, you know, money was trickling in from art, various arts organizations, TV, you know, private donations. So that was the op kind of a very obvious challenge. Um, the other thing was kind of just his buildings are all around the world. So yeah. there was this challenge of, I think at least half our budget was just spent on kind of flying and how and accommodation to try and reach um, these buildings and research them. So we were trying not to turn up at buildings, not having researched them a bit, try and do um, like a recce so we understand what kind of equipment we'll need. And then obviously as well, he's done, I can't remember now, is it some, something like 200 buildings? You know, there's an enormous amount of buildings he's designed. So we had to whittle that down to, um, to less than 20. So we really had to pick and choose what were the key buildings in Kevin's, um, in Kevin's life that are going to showcase what he means to, to the architectural world uh, and to people in general. So that was, that was another challenge. And then there's the other challenge of, I think editing that all down because we have a huge amount of footage and we're trying to make something that's digestible enough for people to engage with um, and not make it a dry arts documentary, you know, make it playful, make it fun, make it cinematic, yeah. Yeah. Um, make it for, make it for non-architects also. Cause I was trying to like, imagine of course, you know, my parents who are non-architects, you know, would they watch an architectural documentary, you know, what would have to be there to try and convince non-architects that this is worthwhile you know so to try to get the voice or the pov of of non-architects in there a little bit um, and convince them that architecture is worthwhile subject to to spend 80 minutes of their time on so I like me yeah that's there were other <laughs> challenges as well but they're the ones that come off the top of my head yeah yeah um i do want to talk about the convention center in dublin but um before that, um, just a comment that I particularly love that sequence where, uh, for lack of a better term, it's, it's, it's a montage of many of his, what we in the States would call corporate campuses, mm -hmm. um, you know, it, it, with outstanding music in the background. Um, and maybe let's talk a little bit about the collaboration that you had with the cinematographer, Kate McCullough, um, the music, David Garrity, um, it just it just all seems to work. How did those collaborations come about and, and what were their challenges in giving a musical and true visual interpretation of his work? I think we were trying to do something that belonged on a big screen. So this wasn't a TV documentary. You know, this was something we wanted to be in cinemas. Mm -hmm. So that meant we were kind of thinking about things on quite a large scale. And in terms of the music as well, we wanted something that was big and orchestral, but also a bit unexpected. So sometimes you hear instruments and there's kind of African drums in there and there's unusual wind instruments that you don't normally associate with mm -hmm. an arts documentary, shall we say. So the musical scape was trying to be quite diverse um, and unexpected um, and give a sense of, I suppose, the thrilling 
that thrilling emotion you have when you experience one of Kevin's buildings. Mm -hmm. And with cinematography then, Kate McCullough, she's one of Ireland's best cinematographers, an amazing kind of um, cinematographer. And her kind of, she got, she got very excited when she saw some of Kevin's buildings because they're so big mm -hmm. that we were able to use helicopters. We were able to use Steadicam. We were able to use dollies, tripods and time lapse. There was a kind of a huge range of photographic tools that we could utilize to capture mm -hmm. his buildings. Mm -hmm. And I suppose the challenge then was kind of narrowing that down to what was the most suitable because we weren't able to get the helicopter for all of his buildings, even though maybe some all of his buildings deserve it. Um, but I suppose narrowing it down to which uh, photographic tool is best going to embody a building of Kevin's so that you feel like you're there, I guess. Um, so that you feel like you're traveling through it. You know, a lot of times yeah. we're yeah. using a mobile camera to take you through the building and looking up and around and, I suppose try to bring you bring Kevin's buildings into your home really was mm -hmm. our that was our brief anyway and I hope we kind of succeed at the end in some respects. Yeah, I, th I think visually it's just um, like I said it's a visual poem really, and and I'm wondering too you know since the last couple of years when it was made how the use of drones for example um, you know how cinematographers are using drones and drone technology to create some of that um, footage that mm. previously would have been outrageously expensive because it would have been tied to, you know, helicopter and, um, you know, all that kind of thing. So um, I, I'm sure that the world of cinematography is, is, is moving on to, you know, using other kinds of things. Um, and talk a little bit about the music and tell us a little bit more about that collaboration. Yeah, he's a he's a really talented composer called David Geraghty, um, and he has this kind of dual life in Ireland. He's he's a rock star in Ireland. He's um, kind of a member of a band called Bell X One, who are one of Ireland's top uh, rock bands. So he's playing concerts and gigging and making studio albums um, during the day, and then at nighttime he's kind of moonlighting uh, for filmmakers making uh, beautiful music compositions. Mm -hmm. for film and tv um, and he's just someone that i've worked with you know ever since my first feature film uh you're ugly too uh, that was called and i just loved how unconventional um he is you know he's not a typical musical composer he's a musician you know who's in a band um so he just comes at it from a different place um so he really started composing the music before he saw anything um he just had this idea in his head of um, big instruments, like bold sounds, um, something that's going to make you really sit up in your seat. Mm -hmm. um, and he wanted the music to sit really beside the visuals. A lot of time we have music in films that sits under the music. Sorry, the music sits under the visuals and it's very much trying not to interrupt the visual, like really just subtly complement it. But mm -hmm. Dave really wanted to... Um, I think make it sit up and peak above the visual sometimes. So sometimes the music can be really quite bold, um, which I really like. And it was a kind of a direction I encouraged him to pursue. Um, so it's a, it's a musical kind of score now that sometimes I'll just put it on my, on my stereo um, because I find it, I find it so beautiful, even with yeah, the visual. I, I, I agree. I, I absolutely love the music. Um, and I, I'm just going to also comment. I think probably one of the challenges you had was finding people who were really critical of Kevin Roche. Um, there is the one gentleman who actually um, is in charge of doing a renovation of one of his projects, um, who you know lets us know that oh he may be quiet but he's got a huge ego. But um, you know let's let's shift to the convention center in Dublin because it does appear as we see in the film that there is a little bit of a hot cold feeling mm -hmm. about that convention center and. You know, certainly, um, you know, having seen it and, and actually was inside of it, you know, I I loved it. But um, talk that through a little bit, because I know it's not universally adored and loved in Dublin. So what was that process like bringing the, the Dublin Convention Center into this film that is so positive, Kevin Roche? Yeah, that's an interesting building of his, you know, it's his only Irish building. And we kind of get in the film, we get into a little bit of the controversy surrounding it. Um, and I think that's really, that controversy is kind of merited, you know, in terms of 
Um, it is part of kind of, um, I don't think it's one of his most successful buildings. And he, he admits that himself, you know, it just, it's, it's fully compromised. You know, there's stuff, there's stuff in it that wasn't supposed to be there and there's things that didn't quite come off. Um, but I think on our part, we were really, I suppose, excited to photograph it because it's, it really dominates that part of the Dublin skyline. Um, it's in this kind of um, Docklands IF financial district of, um, of Dublin. It sits, sits alongside the river and it's got quite a bold facade, um, particularly the front facade. And it seems quite, and it's quite playful as well. You know, it's, it doesn't appear like the normal drab convention center um, in many other cities. Um, but I think there was an element of sadness about it as well, because I think Kevin, he had tried to get a building done in Ireland before, you know, I think he had um, unsuccessfully been approached to build some, you know, numerous buildings in Ireland, but they hadn't come together. Um, and I think that, the fact that this was his um, only Irish building and it took so long to make. I think he, you know, he wasn't prepared for the Irish um, love of bureaucracy and our planning regulations. And um, so there was this real bittersweet, I think, nature to that building. And it's something that architects, you know, all, all of my architect friends, let's say, don't love it. You know, they, they there was a bit of a snobbery about it. And I don't know, part of that might be that, you know, this kind of, you know, Irish Yank architect came in and took this huge commission. You know, there was a little bit of, I think, begrudgery from some architects in Dublin. Um, and maybe part of it then might be that the building was a little bit compromised and didn't have that beautiful subtlety that a lot of Kevin's other buildings had. So, yeah, it's one of those. I think you kind of have to go and visit it and make up your own mind. Um, yeah. Because I kind of, yeah, I do enjoy it more than a lot of my architectural friends shall we say but i still kind of look at it and think it's not not his number one um building shall we say mm -hmm. and it's interesting i hadn't thought about that concept of you know he left ireland he made his name in the united states and then here he is coming back really taking on a major commission um in dublin invisible dublin uh and was that somehow tied into that that 10 year that 10 year process um mm -hmm. Who knows? <laughs> yeah. So, you know, let's, uh, so, so what else are you working on right now? I, you tell us, you know, I, I know you're Berlin based. Um, what are some of the things you have on the boards that we can look forward to in the future? So I've got, um, I'm kind of in early development of another documentary about art um, and culture, I guess. Um, and that's about um, artists who fail. So I'm really interested in the, in the world of artists who give up or fail or have day jobs. Um, that's something I'm kind of uh, just started to work on. Um, and then my day job really is I direct TV in Ireland, which is another thing I, that occupies my, my, uh, my time. And I'm also working on a book adaptation. And so it's a Cork novel where Kevin was from, originally from actually, um, a Cork novel called This Is The Country, uh, which is a dramatic fiction thriller, hoping to film that this year. Um, and then a couple of other TV and film projects in development with Screen Ireland, because I, I write as well. So I'm kind of a writer and director. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so that's keeping my, my place. And I teach, um, teach film as well in a Berlin um, English language third level institution. So that leaves me, yeah. <laughs> about new projects for us leave me busy yeah and that keeps you pretty busy um mm -hmm. just another thought that's come into my mind did you get a sense from kevin in working with him um the degree to which he would return to ireland either as you know a vacation or um how much did he keep his direct connection to ireland obviously he would have had some family etc um did you get any sense of that yeah, a little bit. Um, I think before he got into his 90s, late 80s, he was traveling pretty regularly to Ireland. I think there was a connection. But I think as soon as he got kind of yeah, late, late 80s, I think it was, he wasn't, he tried not to travel as much on planes. Mm -hmm. um, and that trip to Ireland became less frequent. But I know he did say that he liked to go on Google Maps and like go around his old um, childhood town in Cork mm -hmm. and even his childhood house. And he was kind of like, for him, like technology was this amazing way to travel without getting on a plane. Um, Cause I think he was quite nostalgic about his roots and where he was from. 
Mm. Um, because he was, I think he was 26 when he left Ireland. So he was yeah. definitely long enough in Ireland um, for his Irish identity to be fully formed. Mm. But I think he just loved America so much um, that, yeah, he definitely, I mean, it's, it's in the film, he has this great take on, on national, nationality and whether he considers himself Irish or American. And there's yeah. this thing about like, you know, borders, like we're human at the end of the day, which I, I thought it was one of his nicest takes, I have to say. Yeah, yeah. And I also thought it was so incredibly um, bold of him to read a very critical letter um, during his uh, uh, awarding of, when he was awarded the Pritzker Prize, which is, you know, one of the kind of highlight prizes for architects. and. He, he reads a letter of a woman who just goes on and on about how he's soulless and his buildings are soulless. And, and then he kind of drops the mic and he walks away. So, yeah. <laughs> so much yeah. about his personality. Yeah, it's an acceptance speech you'll never see anyone else do. It's really, <laughs> it's, it's, worth, yeah, it's worth watching the whole thing. It's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> that was really quite good. Yeah. So, um, Again, you know, what else do you want to tell us about this film and, and aspects of this film? Um, I, I, again, I just, the cinematography and the music, I do hope in your future projects you get a chance to work with uh, Kate and, uh, um, and um, the musician again. And um, what, else, what else do you want to fill in for us? Um, I don't think there's anything else huge. I think we've covered a lot. Um, I just, I'd love to see more architectural films. So I hope someone who watches this, you know, they'll, they'll make a film, an exciting film about architecture, because I feel like it's an unexplored subject. You know, I mm -hmm. feel like it can be, um, it could be more wild, widely seen on screen, shall we say. So I'd like everyone to, yeah, tell their filmmaker friends to go out there and film some architecture in an exciting and interesting way. Well, and I certainly uh, think that this film can be used as sort of a benchmark um, on how to talk about an architect and someone who, again, we don't we don't normally think of. I think you go into a Gary building, you know you're in a Gary mm -hmm. building. You go into a, you know, Robert A. M. Stern, you know that that's where you are. Mies van der Rohe. Um, even here in D.C., um, there's been a very recent renovation of a Mies van der Rohe building, the Martin Luther King Library. Mm -hmm. And what I find particularly uh, pertinent to Kevin Roche is in the renovation, they put this beautiful rooftop garden in. And it's a space where people can um, sit together. There are meeting rooms mm -hmm. up there, not part of the original Mies van der Rohe design. Mm -hmm. And but again, you know, it's that type of innovation or that standard of architecture, i.e. bringing green space in and bringing collaborative community spaces in even yeah. even put its imprint on a Mies van der Rohe building which I know Kevin Roche had started with as a young man and sort of drifted yeah. off from because the philosophies didn't sink so um, yeah. there's a lot of Kevin Roche in our built environment whether we know it or not <laughs> yeah it's nice to think of yeah and he was also very conscious as well that buildings kind of change and evolve mm -hmm. you know so I think he had you know he knew that you know some of his buildings would need extension or refurbishment you know after 50 years or whatever but I think he seemed yeah. quite kind of content with knowing that buildings you know do move on and evolve and there's ways to improve you know as the decades roll on so yeah yeah he had um he had a nice take on that as well I have to say well Mark again I want to thank you so much for uh taking time you know from your busy day and your busy schedule to um spend some time helping us understand this film a bit more and to understand Kevin Roche a bit more. Um, I know all of us at Solus New and NYU wish you the very best of luck on all your future projects. And uh, we look forward to seeing them. So thank you, Thanks Mark. Thank you, Kate. Um, and hope everyone enjoys the film. Okay, thank you.